Lakeland Public Television, the Bemidji Pioneer, the Brainerd Dispatch, and Northern Community Radio are proud to present Debate Night 2016, a look at our area legislative candidates. And now the State House of Representatives District 2B debate. Your moderator tonight is Warren Larson. Good evening and welcome to the Debate 2016, 11 state legislative debates over four nights. We're at Lakeland Public Television Studios in Bemidji. Our candidates for tonight's debate are Steve Green from the Republican Party and Brian Clawbundy from the Democratic Farm Labor Party. Our panel this evening is Dennis Wyman, Lakeland Public Television News Director, Matthew Ledke from the Bemidji Pioneer, and Scott Hall, Public Affairs Director for Northern Community Radio, KAXE and KBXE. Our rules for this evening's debate. Each candidate will be given three minutes for opening comments. The panel will ask questions after opening comments. Some of their own questions, others may be from the public. The candidates will rotate the order they speak, beginning with opening comments and finishing with closing comments. Each candidate gets two minutes to answer the questions. Each candidate will have a one minute rebuttal opportunity. New this year, candidates will have the option of using one minute of bonus time to add on to one of their answers tonight. This can be used during the answer to the initial question or during the rebuttal, but can only be used once. Questions continue until we are about 50 minutes into the debate when we move on to closing comments. And so let's move on to uh, our debate and our opening comments. Our opening comments, so we'll start with uh, Mr. Steve Green. Well, thank you, Warren and, and panel, and thank you uh, for the viewers at home tonight. It's a great honor to be here. Um, a little bit about myself, for those of you who don't know this, uh, I am the sitting uh, representative in this area. My wife and I have been mar married for 37, almost 38 years now. We live over in the Foston area where we raised our six children. We now have, well, as of the first of the year, we will have 12 grandchildren. The events that are going on in the state and uh, in the country, for that matter, are very concerning to me and over the last years that I've been in office and continuing on if you choose to put me back it, it will be my focus to uh, continue to work for the the freedoms that that I enjoyed when I was uh, younger the freedoms my wife and I enjoyed as we ran our business and raised our family uh, I, I see them uh, disappearing in our country I see the overtaxation, the overregulation that that has been imposed on us by government and uh, I have worked uh, in the time that I've been there to try to reduce that. I'll continue to do that. Uh, we uh, also uh, did some things in the, in the last biennium when the Republicans had control of the House to uh, reduce some of the, the burdens on the veterans. We, we've got uh, their pensions are no longer uh, uh, have income tax charged on them in Minnesota, which was a travesty when it, when it was uh, imposed and now that's gone. Uh, if the tax bill had been signed by the governor, there would have been uh, about $800 million of tax relief uh, just in the one year and, and $500 million ongoing in, uh, in tax relief to Minnesotans. Hope to bring that back when we come back next year. A uh, little bit about our business. Uh, we ha had a greenhouse over in the Foston area. Uh, it was uh, successful for us. And, after our children left home, uh, we decided to cut back a little, and, and so I went into uh, uh, light remodeling work, and my wife is a CNA, and uh, as it turns out, uh, um, you, never, you never really seem to cut back because there's always something else to do. And then I decided to get into to public service, and uh, that is where I've been working now for the last few years, and hopefully that's where I'll continue to work. All right. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Clabundi, your yes. opening comments. Well, I'd also like to thank everybody here tonight. Uh, I'm excited for the opportunity tonight to, to voice our differencing opinions and talk things over. Uh, it's a, quite an exciting moment for me in our, in our venture here. Uh, like I said, I'm Brian Clabundi. Uh, I'm married uh, to my wife, Jennifer, for 15 years. Uh, we have twin daughters that are nine years old. They go to school in Minoman and a two and a half year old son. Uh, we live on our family farm in Wabin, Minnesota. Uh, that farm's been in our family for 102 years now. Uh, I've only been there for 41 of them. 
but uh, my, I always say our son, uh, our claim for him is he, he grows up in the room that I grew up in. So it's kind of a neat deal. It's a, it's a true family farm we have, and uh, we were quite proud of it. Uh, as Jennifer and I were talking about getting into politics, we were into, involved with some uh, different organizations and some leadership stuff. And one of our particular uh, uh, mentors talked about opportunity and the fact of uh, being prepared for opportunity and uh, being ready to take advantage of that opportunity when it presents itself. Um, we're here tonight because we saw an opportunity and we decided to take advantage of this opportunity. Now, if so chosen in November and we're elected, we see a huge opportunity to help fix health care. We see a huge uh, opportunity to help fix property taxes out in our rural areas and in our small towns. We see a huge opportunity to help the education system. These are all, all huge uh, issues in our state of Minnesota and we feel like we're, we're ready to, to tackle the issues. So, um, you know, debate prep for a state house uh, debate when you, you haven't done this before. A lot of it, uh, you know, friends uh, that we got together yesterday and went through some things. Uh, but life on the farm, uh, you know, we, we, when we're harvesting, we have our two-way radios and we, we talk and we actually end up debating all night long, basically. So our farm has provided us uh, debate prep every fall. So on the way to the field this morning, we're combining soybeans and we talked about debate prep on the way to the field and till I left at noon today. So, uh, so as you can tell, Steve's probably got a bit of an advantage on me. Uh, that uh, you know he's done this a few times, so I'm going to do the best I can to to perform as best as I can. Uh, Steve has a disadvantage; uh, he's been down in St. Paul, and he's uh, has to to explain what's happened down there with not no uh, action happening, and uh, and that's what we'll be discussing tonight. So, looking forward to the opportunity, and uh, have a great night. Thank you. Um, our first question is for Mr. Clabundi, and it comes from Scott Hall. All right. Thanks, Warren. Um, the growth of big agriculture in northwestern Minnesota, potatoes, soybeans, green beans, and other crops, is having a negative impact on water quality and quantity. Mm -hmm. And what is being done, or what can be done, by the growers and by the state of Minnesota to conserve water and minimize pollution? And specifically, uh, but not only, do you support a moratorium on new wells in some ag areas? Um, well, well, let's start with phase one here. Um, I think it's important that we need to know what our, our levels, we want to set our water quality issues at. We want to make sure that uh, we know what the targets are. As uh, long as farmers know their target and they know uh, where they're going, they can manage their practice at that point. Uh, there is money out there through the federal government, through the CSP program, that they are, they are paid to closely monitor and manage their water quality. Um, so a, a lot of, lot's been done with agriculture in the last five years. There is a conscious effort to improve what they're doing. Um, it's, it, they, they need a little bit more time, but they are moving forward with that. Um, as far as a moratorium on drilling, not, no, not right now. I would not support a moratorium on drilling wells right now. If, uh, if there were, if there were concerns got worse, then that's something that could be taken, and nothing's ever off the table, right? You can always take a look at it, but uh, from that perspective, no. All right, thank you. Mr. Green. Thank you for the question. When, when this uh, uh, issue first came up, uh, I was, uh, I was in, the, in the House at that time, and uh, the Democrats had complete control. And, and they pretty much uh, did everything they could to decimate our farm community with these issues. Uh, and so I started looking into this, and so I didn't make my decisions based just on, on feelings. Even though uh, the farming community is about 37% of our economy, and we can't afford to damage it too much more, we've already, we've already decimated our logging and our mining, and our industry is leaving the state. Farming is about the only thing we have left, because we're going after our resorts now too. Uh, the farmers that, that do irrigation and, uh, and are next to rivers and lakes are required to monitor. They have monitoring wells and they have monitoring within the streams. And I've watched the data. 
They, they have to uh, report to the MPCA once a month. And if you look at the data that they're bringing in, they are doing extremely well. There's only, uh, if, uh, if you look at the, the uh, statistics that are there, the measurable statistics, the only one that is not either at or below the standard levels is chloride. And they're working on that. And even that is only over by like 0 0.05. So the farmers are doing a good job. And, and we've asked them to do a good job, they've done a good job, and then what happened is the Democrat Party came after them again and, uh, and demanded more. And it was not fair, and uh, I think that you have to look at all the statistics. You can't just say the, they're polluting the water without looking at uh, the statistics, statistics that are out there for proof. Even, even over toward the west, the Red River uh, is cleaner than it's been in 40 years. So something that they're doing is working. Okay, Mr. Klaubundi, any other comments? Yeah, as a farmer, I feel I, I'm the best suited to, to uh, be involved with these judgments on, on uh, the water quality issues. Uh, you have to have clean water to have a viable community. It's just plain and simple. Without a good clean water source, there's no one that's gonna be there. And we know that from other parts of the country that have extreme water issues, so. Um, as a farmer, I'm a conventional farmer that uh, operates like any other large farm you see uh, around. I, we have to manage our water quality. It is really important. So, thank you. All right. Mr. Green, any additional comments? <laughs> yeah. Uh, as a farmer, you should know that if you look at the farmers that are out there with the irrigation wells and farming next to these uh, resources, that they are doing the monitoring and they are doing what they're supposed to be doing. So, so then instead of going after them and punishing them for doing what we've asked them to do, maybe we should look at, at uh, what's being recorded and go off uh, the statistics that are there. I, I really think it's a, 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 a working together is gonna to be the key to this. We need to have clean water and we have to have farmers that can uh, okay. operate. All right. Um, we'll move on to our next uh, question, and that's for Mr. Green, and that comes from Dennis Wyman. All right, thanks, Warren. Thank, thank you both for being here tonight. Uh, this is, well, we've been doing these debates a lot of years now. This is the 10th one I'm involved in, dating back to 1998. And it seems like every two years we're talking about health uh, healthcare costs, health insurance costs. Can you assess the state uh, in your... Uh, in your opinion, the state of, uh, of Minsure right now, and uh, what would you do if elected to, to help, uh, help deal with these uh, health, health insurance costs a lot of Minnesotans are dealing with? Thank you for that question, Dennis. Uh, in 2013, when the Democrats rammed this down our throat, not one Republican voted for it. Uh, it, was not, it was not difficult to see that this was not gonna work and uh, the people who were looking at the numbers told us it wasn't going to work and yet we got it anyway and now we're faced with uh, uh, people who are actually not even going to be able to get insurance they're going to be forced off the policies that they have and there's nothing there for them under the Minsure plan and it's important to understand and to know that before Minsure and before the Affordable Care Act Minnesota was at the top of the, the, the hill on this as far as providing coverage and at the bottom as far as cost. We were doing an excellent job here. We had 93% of Minnesotans were covered by some kind of a policy. The others, 7% uh, had access if they would have chosen to take that access. And now with the Minsure, we're, we're told that they've upped that to 96%, but that's false because when you count the people that uh, first of all, had their premiums doubled and tripled so that, that they can having a hard time making their premiums and their deductibles have gone from 2000 to 6000 to 10000 That's not coverage. They're not going to reach that unless they have a catastrophic uh, illness. So Minsure needs to be repealed and buried and then go back and do the things we should have done in the first place, which was to, to work on lowering the cost through medical savings accounts. We could have also used excuse me, we could, have, we could have had insurance being be able to purchase across state lines which have opened up uh, competition within the insurance market and, and these things alone. And we also need tort reform. We need reform in our courts to cut back on some of the frivolous lawsuits that are driving up the cost of, of medical care. 
All right, thank you. Mr. Klabundi, same question. Um, well, the Affordable Care Act isn't going anywhere anytime soon. So, I mean, replace, repeal and replace isn't going to happen. So what we got to figure out is what we can do to improve the system we got. I actually am one of the people in the, ind in the individual market, our family is, that has skyrocketing premiums, skyrocketing, uh, uh, you know, our premiums are going up and our coverage is going down. Uh, we got deductibles that are going up all the time. Uh, just to simply keep it on an affordable premium. Um, what can we do in the, you know, so we need to fix this in a short term uh, manner now, because, uh, you know, pumping some money in to help, uh, maybe a tax credit to help these people in the individual market that are really struggling and, and uh, need, need that help. There's a lot of small business, uh, self employed uh, people that, you know, it, they need help now, not sit and argue for three more years and maybe something changes. So when, we, that, when I get there, that's something I'm gonna help uh, address right away. Okay, th thank you, Mr. Green. Any other comments? No. Um, Club Bundy, any additional comment? Uh, just that, you know, um, the Affordable Care Act hasn't been all bad. Um, my wife had cancer and without that, we wouldn't have access to, uh, to healthcare. And it, it, we're actually quite, uh, you know, thankful for that. But at the same time, uh, we realize that we can't afford these premiums as they're going. We need to really make some changes there. So there, there's definitely was some uh, pluses to it. Now we gotta, we gotta find that, that, that good even spot. So thank you. All right, thank you. The next question is to Mr. Klabundi and it's from Matthew Ledke. Uh, this question is regarding foster care. Um, the issue of foster care is a major one across the entire state of Minnesota. Um, there's a, many more children being entered into foster care placement and um, not enough people providing foster care now. Um, at the state level, what would you support or what are you in favor of to help uh, curb this problem? From my perspective, um, you know, I'm not an expert <coughs> on foster care. I, I, I'm just not. And, uh, I would have to look to the sources. I would have to talk to people to s and find out what people need. I'm not just gonna make a, a, a rash decision. I, I wanna talk to people. I wanna talk to uh, foster care providers. I wanna talk to uh, social workers that are helping place foster care kids in, uh, in, in, in custody. Uh, all, the, all those things I would, you know, that's what I would do as a legislator. I would go talk to the people on the ground and find out you know, what needs to be done, and I would approach it from that direction. At this point, do I have a specific plan to fix foster care that would, uh, no, I don't, but I would certainly be more than happy to, uh, it's, you know, the poverty is rampant in our district, and uh, it is very important that I would get out there and put boots on the ground and, and help find a solution for that. Okay. Uh, Mr. Green. The, the foster care issue comes up constantly and, and rightfully so. Uh, there are things that I think that, that we're, we're not doing. And, and one of those is not looking in, into the reasons why the, the displacement of, of the families is, is increasing the way that it is. Uh, one of the things that I've tried to do was to go into the local units of government, the counties and, and also with the tribe, and, and try to find out what, what they think we can do to keep these kids within their own families. We have, a, we have a problem within our society that's causing this. And it, we do this, we do this with, uh, uh, with our uh, correctional system and with other things too in Minnesota where we, we see a problem and say, boy, that's a problem. We go try to, to remedy the problem where we're at instead of going back to the source. And we need to go back to the source. What we're doing, uh, in, in the way of uh, family services obviously isn't working because if it was working, our foster care uh, wouldn't be increasing. So I think that, uh, you know, I think that we, we haven't really made any strides there. No one wants to really dig in. And, and I guess it is hard. It's hard to go in and, and tell family members that, that what you're doing is wrong. But something, something drastic has to be done uh, with this because, um, to sit here and talk about foster care is one thing when you're talking to the camera, but to go out and, and speak to the families and talk to the county units and really see firsthand what's happening, it's pretty devastating. 
I wish that I had the magic wand. I don't, but I do think that we need to go to the source and, uh, and tr start correcting it for future years as well as the problem in, at hand. All right. Mr. Kalabundi, any additional comments? No. Uh, Mr. Green, any additional comments? Okay. And then we'll have uh, our next question will be for Mr. Green, and, uh, and that is from Scott Hall. Okay. Minnesota State Universities and, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to start over. Minnesota State Universities and community colleges are in financial trouble. How can we assure Bemidji State and our community and technical colleges continue to offer high quality post-secondary options? The, the one thing with, with the university is, is they've got increases every year. We are, we are going broke funding the universities and, and the MinSCU and even the K-12. And there's nothing wrong with putting money into them, but we do, we do need to demand results. We need to find out uh, where, we can, where we can trim costs within the university so they can save money for themselves and, uh, and, and put into their own programs. One thing where we failed drastically is over the last few years, we have gotten away from, from the technical colleges, from the trades. Uh, we, are, we are putting people through four-year colleges now, and they're coming out with debt that they can't pay. And our option now seems to be let's forgive the debt uh, but the problem with that is uh, it's not going to cure the problem because if, if you are one of the lucky people that gets a job, you're going to be paying taxes. So you're not only going to be paying back your own debt, you're going to be paying back everybody else's too. This is a problem that we have to address and we have to start addressing it within the, the junior high system at the very least. We're getting, getting the trades back into the high schools, getting people, give, getting kids an option. As to, as to where they want to go in life, if that's what they choose to do. And I, I will also uh, been a big proponent of the trades for other reasons. You, you never lose what you learn on hands-on education. So if you're, if you're schooled in the trades, whether it's welding, robotics is really big, uh, or, uh, or anything else, carpentry, those things will stick with you for the rest of your life, even if you do decide to go to four-year college. But it'll better prepare you for the hands-on and the... Uh, uh, the skills that you receive uh, with, with those training uh, programs. And that's, so that's what I would like to do. And we have been working on that. I think we've made some inroads. We've got a ways to go to get it across Minnesota. Um, Mr. Klaubundi, same question. Yep. Um, I like to look at education in a, in a, in a big picture thing. Uh, if we want success at the, at, the, at the top end, it starts with a good base at the bottom end. Um, starting with pre-K education at a good base, uh, finding out if kids have a learning disability. Uh, we have that in our family. I have a daughter that's dyslexic. We found out early. We got our daughter uh, the help she needed. She's a successful fourth grader right now uh, enjoying school without us stepping in, making sure that uh, she got um, the help she needed. She might be a struggling fourth grader that leads into a successful junior high student. Uh, and this is where Steve and I are gonna agree. We want, uh, I would like to see a, a program where we're guiding students into a certain direction, uh, starting in that early, uh, in early uh, junior high, where they're kind of thinking about a career. Uh, my, my campaign manager, uh, her and her husband own a plumbing business uh, in Wabin, Minnesota. And it's, t you know, it's tough to find uh, qualified people. They want to you know, work on some sort of maybe a scholarship program that they can help pay for school for kids. Uh, all, all kinds of different ideas are out there. The, two -year, the VOTEC thing, getting back to that, my, you know, my wife and I both went to a two-year school. Uh, she went on to a um, four-year school. But um, it comes down to money. You go, you go to you know, the VOTEC or... Uh, in the North Dakota system, uh, we went to NDSCS to get our to get our two-year degrees because it saved us a ton of money compared to the four-year colleges. Um, it's just pure economics. Um, getting the cost of some of these four-year schools down, uh, may, you know, start now with a uh, tuition freeze maybe, and going forward, look at some of the administration costs and what we can do to reel reel some of that in. And uh, you know, I, I would hate to be a kid getting out of college with a, a ton of debt and uh, trying to start a family. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Green, any uh, additional comments? Well, I would agree that we need to address the administration cost within the universities. Uh, it, is, it is way out of hand. Um, 
and, and that, that leads to, to the other debt. Uh, we have tried some things that don't seem to be working for rural Minnesota, and one is the, the debt forgiveness for those kids that come back and work in the area. And the problem with that is that in nursing, for instance, we have a terrible uh, time getting folks back because even if we, we uh, uh, try to entice them with debt forgiveness, if they'll come back and work in our hospitals, it doesn't even come close to what the Mayo Clinics or the university, universities can pay in Minneapolis. And when you're a young uh, person getting out of college, it's, it's really hard to compete with the life of the cities. And so I, I would like to see us uh, try to, to go after some of the people that are starting a family who want to raise their family in what I believe to be the greatest community in the United States, in northern Minnesota. And so those are some of the things that we're working on now. Okay, thank you. Mr. Klaubundi, any additional comments? Yeah, you know, I mean, that when you're drawing families back to our, our district, we've got to make sure that you know, all the opportunities are there that they have in the metro out here. We need broadband across the whole district. Uh, we need uh, we need the arts. We need things that bring families back to our area. We need uh, trails and park systems that are thriving and successful to bring in these young families. Um, you know that's how we'll bring people back here with a good investment in our in our district. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question is to Mr. Uh, Klabundi, mm -hmm. and it's from Dennis Wyman. We'll stick with the education end of things right now. We'll switch shift it to K through 12. What do you see as the biggest education issues facing rural Minnesota schools? And what would you do to even out the disparity between metro schools and rural schools? Well, when, when we've been traveling around meeting with superintendents uh, and administration in, the, in our local schools, one, one thing you hear, you hear a lot of the same, th same things over and over again. Uh, special ed, uh, Funding special ed teachers, uh, crowding uh, in, in these programs is a big issue. Um, they're, they're looking for help. Um, so I think th there's one area in our district that uh, uh, we, we would try to help out right away, uh, some sort of program to get more people into special ed, more to get people out to these rural areas. Uh, school counselors is another big one. Uh, we have a lot of kids that need some help uh, making these decisions in life and where they're going. And uh, I was a kid that went to college the first year and didn't know what I wanted. I, I showed up at Concordia College in Moorhead and they asked me what I wanted to be. And I had no idea. I said, teacher? And you know, that obviously didn't work out too good for me. But uh, so, you know, guidance counselors are a big need out there. Special ed's a big need. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, pre-K education, I think, is such a, a solid uh, investment for these rural communities with all the poverty that we have out here. Um, uh, getting kids uh, that foundation to their education uh, is so important. Having kids that are, um, you know, reading to learn in third grade instead of learning to read. These are things that have to happen. So there's a lot of good things in education. We have a, a great teachers, uh, uh, you know, I never want to say anything ever bad about the teachers. Sometimes your hands are tied and we have to take some, untie the teacher's hands and help them at some point here too, so thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Green, same question. Well, uh, we did do some stuff to relieve the disparities, the financial disparities between the, the metro and the rural Minnesota. Um, unfortunately, it's like pulling teeth because the metro area has a lot of pull down there, as you know. Uh, but they do get funding uh, massively, amount, massive amounts more funding per student than we do up here. Uh, the argument can be made that maybe we don't need quite as much, but uh, because, because of our school systems, and we have better school systems, uh, we have some of the best in rural Minnesota. And so maybe funding isn't, isn't all of it, but it's a big part of it. And then to keep working on that. Uh, I don't agree with the universal pre-K. I think that the best foundation you can give a child is in the home. Um, we have been moving our children into the education system earlier and earlier, and we are getting a disconnect among our, among our kids. If you look at what's happening in our area, as the kids grow up uh, in, in this area alone, we have huge uh, problems with uh, drug abuse, uh, with uh, kids who, who have no direction. And the school system keeps telling us that, that, that they can fix the problem, 
but the problem's not being fixed. And, and we're not going back and looking at what's working and what's not. We just continue to plow down this road. Universal pre-K, uh, you know, we're already now trying to move four-year-olds into a new kindergarten and have the new uh, pre-K uh, pre be from infant to three years old. You really want your kids in a school system at that young? There's, there's no substitute for parents. And, and we need these kids in their homes uh, with their parents whenever possible for as long as we can keep them there until they're ready for school, whether that's six, seven years old, whatever the case may be. All right, uh, Mr. Claude Bundy, any additional comments? Yeah, I would say homes riddled with poverty, drug abuse, and uh, chemical dependency is probably the number one reason why we need uh, universal pre-K. We can't have, there's no offense, but I'm, the amount of parenting going on in a chemical dependency household is gonna be pretty minimal. Um, we, we need to, to help identify where these problems are within these families and uh, getting them into school and making sure they have the nourishment they need, uh, make, sh make sure they're getting some nourishment, making sure uh, uh, they're getting some base to know that school is not necessarily a bad thing and uh, you know, get a positive, good experience for them. Play-based education is a, a good way to get kids interested in uh, school and keep them coming back. So that's all I'll say. Thank you, Mr. Green. You're making the assumption that most of the homes in, in rural Minnesota are, are in poverty and they're, and they're somehow abusing their children. That's not the case, simply not the case. You, you, yes, we have, there, there may be some out there and we can identify them, but to roll everybody into that and say, well, there's some abuse going on, so let's grab all the kids, it's not the answer. All right, uh, we'll move on to the next uh, <clears throat> question. And that uh, question is for Mr. Green and that is with uh, Matthew Ledke. Uh, Mr. Green, this question um, is regarding the minimum wage. Um, I'm wondering about your stance on the minimum wage and if you support any increases in it at the state level. No, I don't. Minimum wage is, uh, is a joke. If, if, if you're starting at an at a, at a entry-level job, you're starting out maybe in a restaurant, Restaurant, restaurateurs can't afford to pay their waitresses $15 an hour. And we're seeing that now in Minnesota where a lot of them are going into the, the electronic waiter because they can't, they can't uh, pay that. You can't go into a business and mandate how much they pay. And as far as the regular level jobs, minimum wage also isn't, isn't even applicable there because you're not, gonna, you're not gonna hire anybody that's, that's skilled for under the $15 an hour. So our wages are above that anyway. So all you're really affecting with the, with the minimum wage job is the entry level jobs. We're taking jobs away from our youth who, who would be working after school or weekends. Taking jobs away from, from uh, a parent who needs, who needs a little extra income that now that job is not there. And so, uh, and the, uh, the other thing with the minimum wage job, it, uh, it, it, uh, it allows bargaining power for the unions which drives up the cost of, of a lot of different things. And so minimum wage is not gonna work, not, not the way they're pushing it, not at 15 bucks an hour. Okay, Mr. Claude Bundy, the same question. Yeah, um, it's, it, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting concept and it never hurts to debate the concept. I think it's, it's a, you know, a fun idea to where it can work, where it doesn't work. Uh, those are all you know, good conversations to have. Is it gonna work on Main Street, Minoman? Uh, I visited with the owners at a particular hardware store one time and you know at some point they may say I wish we made $15 an hour working here you know that's not just just not feasible in some of these small town areas in greater Minnesota in downtown St. Paul is it possible can it be you know I think they did do that uh, will it work there it probably will be because the dollar can circulate so many times is it going to work in greater Minnesota Probably not, but is it a conversation worth having? Yeah, I think it is a conversation worth having. But as you know, um, as of now, you know, it's it's just a conversation as as of now. All right, Mr. Green, any other comments? Uh, Mr. Clubundi, any other comments? No. no. All right. All right. Our next question is um, for Mr. Clubundi, and it was with Scott Hall. Okay. Uh, how well is your district? Uh, connected to broadband technology and um, how important do you think it is for the economic uh, quality of, of our 
district 2A? 2B. 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 Right uh, it's very Portland. important. Um, it's, a, it's a big district. It's a broad district. Uh, I have a friend that was, uh, he's in IT, and uh, so his job is basically works overnight in, in India on software. And he was living in Maple Grove, I think it was, and he, he made the decision, um, you know, I want to take my family, I want to move back to our roots, I want my kids to be able to come out and jump in the track. I farm with his brother. You know, he goes, I, he wanted to come out and uh, uh, jump in a tractor and show his kid the way of rural living out in Minnesota and get him away from the, the metro life. So at, as he was doing this, he was looking for places to build his new house. Well, he had to be extremely site specific. In fact, uh, he couldn't go build a new house on his home farm because uh, it just wasn't possible because there was no broadband access right there about three miles from my farm. I do have broadband at my farm. Um, he, had, he had to look until he found the right spot with the broadband access. Now, how many people are we deterring from moving out here with not having that access? I think that is something that we could really help um, draw families back into our, our area. Also, you know, how many families struggle and uh, are working hard and uh, uh, get a, you know, run a small business, a Mary Kay, uh, business, uh, creative memories, a tastefully simple. And the, if you don't have the broadband, broadband access at home, that means you got to go to work and do it and take time off, uh, you know, at, from your employer. So uh, I think getting us wired uh, border to border in our state is of utmost importance. And I think uh, it, it's, it, when it comes to education, it's become, it's become continually more important uh, all along. We should have the same right to the same opportunities that I have in the metro as we have out here in greater Minnesota. It's just plain and simple. Uh, it's going to be it's going to be the new electricity. So we need to invest. All right. Thank you, Mr. Green. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, broadband is important. We did stick some money into broadband. Um, we uh, we were told from the start that they needed about 20 million into broadband and. And then we said, well, you know, we, we did the numbers and we came up with a number of actually 35 million. And then, of course, that wasn't good enough. Then they wanted 100 million. But, uh, but I think we settled in at 35 million. We do have broadband coming out here now into some of the underserved areas and unserved areas. Uh, we, uh, I want to take a, a, a hard look at it as we're putting it in because the problem that we have with technology is its half life is so short. And by the time we get the broadband in, there might be something new on, on the horizon already. The other issue that I had uh, with pumping too much in at one time is it gets to be really uh, lucrative for bigger companies to come in. And when, when we do make the switch to the, to the wireless broadband, which I think will be in our future, uh, I want it to be far enough into the future where we're not gonna hurt some of our seniors who still rely on our landlines. Because if we take too much of our landlines away, with the, wi with the wireless broadband, we're gonna be harming some of the folks that still rely on, on the old phone services and, and the things that, that they need. And, uh, and also, it's gonna take a while to get that wireless in. So we have, to, we have to continue to support the broadband issue, but also continue to look at it and make sure that we're not gonna be dumping a bunch of money into a system that has become outdated. Okay, Mr. Klaubundi, any additional comments? Yep, uh, some of the broadband that's been put in is already outdated. Technology moves that fast simply. Uh, you're not gonna be able to avoid that. You can't put off spending the money on it assuming that something better is coming down the road shortly. It may, it may not, it might be 10 years, it might be 25 years. A strong investment now and, uh, is what is important. Um, I, would, I, I think the 35 million was a uh, scratch the surface of what we need and uh, we need to fight harder for our, our areas. Uh, Technology is always evolving. There's always gonna be something, but that doesn't mean we simply wait in fear, waiting for something to come around. We need to move forward, we need to invest. That's what's gonna bring people here. Thank you, Mr. Green, any other? Uh, yeah, you just proved my point. You just got done telling people that, that what we've already put in is obsolete. Yeah. Perfect, perfect example. Yeah. And so if we're looking down the line and I'm, and I'm looking at the AT&Ts, and, and, they're, and they're saying that within two years, 
you know, we're going to have uh, wireless internet popping out to these communities, and then you're telling me you want to put more than more than 35 million at a time in, when in 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 truth. The, the folks that are applying for these grants and putting this in have already told us this is how much we can do. It is, so if we dump in the, the amounts that they're talking all at one time, it's going to sit there for two or three years before it's used up anyway. It's going to be a okay, constant. Mr. Would you like to use your minute? Your, your no. Minute? Oh. All right. Uh, well, then let's move on to the, the next question, and it's to Mr. Green, and it's with Dennis Wyman. Question on taxes, how do you feel about the current tax system and also uh, taxes in general in Minnesota and what would you, would you strive for any changes at all? I, I don't like our tax system th that we have here and we could start with property taxes. Property taxes are way too high in Minnesota and, and we keep looking for, for ways to lower property tax and, and incentives. But one of the things that I wanna make clear to people today is that we have a problem in Minnesota with uh, a loss of a, ta a property tax base. In Minnesota, we have roughly 56 million acres. 17% of that is owned by the state. The state of Minnesota is the third largest landowner in the United States. The only people that own more than Minnesota are the United States government and the state of Alaska. 8% of our, our, uh, our land mass is owned by the federal government in some way. So that's 25% right there. When you add in the lakes, we're at 29%, and that does not include our, uh, our lake, our, excuse me, our nonprofits, and, and it also doesn't include easements. So we have a problem in Minnesota with the state buying and owning too much land. It also takes away from young folks who want to move back to the area because there's no place for them to move that, that isn't uh, so far outpriced because of the lack of property that's here. And these are issues that we definitely have to address. Uh, the other tax issues, we, we, we implemented the fourth tier. And when we did, we lost massive amounts of people who are in that category in the state. It's estimated that by the uh, Minnesota revenue that Minnesota lost nearly a billion dollars in the upcoming years by folks who left the state because they just refused to pay that, e that extra tax. We don't live in a society anymore where we're gonna keep people here uh, and, and just assume they're gonna continue to pay. The other is the business tax. We have uh, very burdensome business taxes. We have, we have a business property tax that's extra on top of the local property tax. And we just tax them because we can. The money just goes into the general fund down at, the, down at uh, St. Paul and is dispersed out the way the politicians see fit. We need some major overhauls within our tax system. All right, Mr. Claude Bundy, same question. Um, obviously property tax is gonna be a big one in our, in our district. Uh, it uh, it's it's burdensome at this point, and it needs it needs to uh, needs to be fixed. You know, there was an opportunity to fix it with the tax bill, but that uh, failed to uh, it failed to get through due to lack of uh, bipartisanship on other bills. So that's something that we need to you know that's an impact that uh, impact my farm this year. Um, other taxes, you know, when you took it look at business and business taxes. You know, I've talked to a lot of businesses. I have a brother that owns a manufacturing business uh, with a high school friend of his. They started on our shop and our farm uh, and they've grown it from a 30 by 30 shop to a multi-million dollar uh, business with a lot of employees. Um, and I asked him, I said, what do you, th what, you know, what's your, you know, he's a pretty, he's a, he's a businessman and he, he follows every number. And uh, he said, taxes will be what they're going to be. They, they're just there. You deal with them. But he goes, what we need is, a, with the state of Minnesota, is to streamline our ability to operate, to, to move our businesses forward. Uh, that, that's what's uh, important to them. They want to be able to, uh, you know, if there is a tax code issue, you know, have an accessible uh, Minnesota revenue system where they can get answers without uh, hassle, without, you know, huge fines, things like that. Um, there's ways to streamline and uh, reform some of this uh, that won't, you know, won't cost a lot of money and uh, it will help our businesses succeed. Okay, thank you. Mr. Green, any uh, additional comments? Yeah, if you want to talk about the overregulation, that's a different question and we could be here for a very long time. But uh, the, the tax issue and property tax alone, just that business property tax, for some of the bigger businesses, they tell me it makes up 30% of their property tax. Uh, and so it is a huge issue that we, we need to deal with. Okay. Uh, Mr. Do you have any additional comments? Uh, no. All right. Uh, next question would go to Mr. Claude Bundy, and they would be from Matthew Ledke. 
Uh, this question is regarding pipelines. Um, recently in our region, there's been uh, talk of pipelines um, ranging from the sandpiper getting pushed back by Enbridge to also Enbridge's line three replacement. Um, I'd just like to get your overall stance on, on pipelines and uh, your thoughts on um, some of the current conversations that's been going around them recently. Yeah, um, it's well, obviously it's a it's a huge issue uh, from here to North Dakota right now. Um, fi you know, finding an acceptable route for the pi pipeline that's going to make uh, make it easier to to work and operate for them to to move things through is uh, important. Uh, I'm, I'm I am happy it's not going through the headwaters of the Mississippi. I think that there could be a, a better location maybe. Um, that's not for me to decide, I guess. Uh, uh, we, you know, my kids go to a school uh, one block from the railway. You know, there's a lot of oil traffic, uh, potentially dangerous. We had a propane explosion in Callaway, Minnesota this last winter. Uh, could have been a loaded propane, or could have been a loaded oil train, could have been a, a serious disaster. At the same time, I'm not gonna sit here and fight for the oil companies and their, and their pipelines. They, that's for their battle to do. They can, they can, if they need to find their, their route, that's up to them to do, not for me. All right, Mr. Green? I am in favor of the pipelines, I have been. We have uh, many pipelines underground right now. The Line 3 especially needs to be replaced. It's getting older. Uh, just this morning, you know, we got word that there was some sabotage uh, in the pipelines, actually, I, I, apparently across the nation, but in the Clearbrook area where they tried to, they broke in, tried to close some valves, which could have caused major damage and loss of life. It, uh, it's unacceptable for, for that kind of uh, irresponsible actions to take place. But, but the fact is, pipelines are the safest, most efficient way to move oil. If we're not gonna move it by pipelines, we're gonna move it by rail, and our rails are taxed uh, greatly. In the last, last year, I believe it was, the, the railroads put half a billion dollars into upgrading their railroads, and, and I still haven't seen anything done uh, through my area on Frazee where, where the tracks, uh, the spikes are coming out of the tracks. And, and having these oil li uh, pipelines in place would have relieved some of that. It also would have freed up uh, some of the rail cars for, for moving uh, farm produce, which we desperately need as well. Uh, this, it's, it's not responsible to believe that we can, uh, we can function as a nation without oil. It is, it is our lifeblood. Uh, it, it goes in, if you traveled here tonight, you used it. Um, if, you're, if you're doing anything that, uh, that allows you to survive in, in the world today, in some way you're affected by the price of oil. Uh, now the Enbridge line apparently has been killed coming through here, so, so they won. But just for the record, uh, the counties along the pipeline lost about $23 million in property tax relief because of it. Okay, Mr. Corbundi, any additional comments? Yeah, that, I mean, that's, these are all reasons why it's a, it's a tricky question. You know, uh, we, want, we want safe rails, we want open rails. We also want clean water. We want uh, safe water s sources. Uh, we, you know, we got to make sure we're prudent on every decision and location and uh, we d just need to really uh, make sure we're making right decisions. We can't have uh, rash decisions affecting water qualities for generations. You know, not, you know, not saying anything, but you really got to watch, you know, how we're doing this. I, those are, it's, it's too important to mess it up. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Green, any additional comments? We are watching how we're doing it. I, it it's, not, it's another one of those issues where I don't just sit down one day and say I, that I support uh, pipelines. I went and I and I viewed the pipelines. I've I've gone into where they are and I've and I've uh, uh, gone to watch how they're made, and and all the safety features that are on them, the equipment that they have that go through the pipelines to test them regularly for weak spots. Uh, it's uh, the the shutoffs. If there's any variation in the in the pressure in the flow of the of the oil going through, the the lines automatically quit and valves shut. Uh, so they've done a good job to, to keep these things safe. And uh, I think that it was a real blow to northern Minnesota when that line got stopped. All right, well, we've run out of time uh, as far as for questions, and so we're now going to move to our closing comments. Each candidate has two minutes to close, and um, uh, starting closing comments will uh, be Mr. Klaubundy. 
Well, as always, I want to thank you guys for the opportunity to be here tonight. Uh, truly a learning experience for me. This, this whole experience of running for office is, uh, I've met a lot of new friends and we've uh, experienced things that I never thought I would get to see. So uh, I, I am very appreciative to all that. Um, when I'm in St. Paul, I'm, I'm going to be my own boss. As a self-employed farmer, I have an independent mind and it's truly impossible for me, me to believe that Republicans have 95% of the good ideas. Uh, there's gotta be some uh, working across party lines. Uh, that's what we're here, that's why we're uh, uh, running for office. Um, you know, at, when the state finished the session, uh, they really didn't pass anything. They didn't, they didn't get anything done. Uh, if you're a contractor, and you're uh, working on a road and you have a deadline and you don't meet your deadline, there's penalties, there's, uh, uh, there's violation, there's fines that go with that. The only penalty for this is we're paying the penalty by our bonding uh, projects not getting passed, by our uh, tax bill not getting passed. These are things that are just too important to our local communities that uh, I will work hard to make sure that uh, we're not operating at the last minute. We're operating on time and uh, getting things done on time. As a farmer, that's how I know I have to operate my business, and uh, I hope other people realize that also. Um, I, like, once again, I, I really appreciate the, the time. Uh, come November 9th, I hope uh, it's my time to become the next representative of District 2B, uh, I will do everything I can to uh, help the district expand uh, opportunities for young families and uh, vote Clubundi because uh, we, we can do this. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Green, your closing comments. Well, too, thank everybody for tuning in tonight. Um, I'm going to have to switch my closing comments a little bit just to uh, inform you that in the first half of the biennium, we fully funded the government. We passed all the budget bills and all the tax bills as we needed to pass. In the, in the second half of the biennium, we passed a supplemental tax bill with 89% uh, bipartisan approval in the House. And it was only because the governor decided he didn't want to sign it that we don't have that. And like I say, that was about seven eight $800 million in tax relief for Minnesotans on a, uh, immediately and $500 million in an ongoing basis. And the governor used it as a tool. Uh, the bonding bill, the first bonding bill that went through the House, uh, I did vote for. It was uh, $800 million, a little higher than I wanted when you add both years together, but it was mostly roads and bridges. When it went to the Senate and came out of conference committee, they were playing games. It was very clear at that point that there was not going to be a bonding bill, and it came back bigger and more bloated, and I wouldn't vote for the second half of it. It passed anyway, and, it, and we sent it back to the Senate under an agreement, and in the last few minutes of session, the Senate dumped light rail on it. And just to clarify on light rail, the people in the cities do not want light rail. The Met Council, which is an unelected government group, is pushing for the light rail. The people paying the taxes there do not want it. And, and so this was a game that was played. I had been listening to from, uh, rhetoric coming from the governor's office and from the Democrat side all session. During the, during the 2016 year that if they could send us into the election as a do-nothing Congress, they would have a better chance in the election. And that's what happened in the end of session. But keep in mind, the state was fully funded, transportation was fully funded, the supplemental bills didn't pass because of political games on the Democrat side. All right, well, thank you. I, I'd like to take this time to thank our candidates for participating in tonight's debate. Um, I have a great amount of admiration for individuals that are willing to step up and serve our communities and the, this great state of Minnesota. Uh, if you've missed any portion of tonight's debate and would like to watch it again, it will be available on Lakeland Public Television website within 24 hours. That website is lptv.org. Also, to read a recap of tonight's debate, you can pick up a copy of tomorrow's Bemidji Pioneer or log on to the Bemidji Pioneer website at BemidjiPioneer.com. Uh, you can listen to the audio of the debates at kaxe.org. Um, there are going to be two more nights of debates uh, coming up. 
uh, tomorrow night, Thursday, October 13th, in the Brainerd studio at 7 p.m., a Senate 9, Senator uh, Gazilka, Gazilka uh, the Democrat, and the Republican uh, Jason Wienerman. Uh, that ends our debates for tonight. Uh, thanks for watching. Yeah. <laughs>